Well, hey, Churchill, I hope you've had a good week, uh, despite everything. Um, our passage just read to us uh, raises a pretty fundamental question that people have asked, you know, since the beginning of time. How could we possibly have clarity about uh, God uh, beyond just our speculations, our life experiences, our projections? Um, there are so many different pictures uh, of God, and this sort of complicates the matter further. Um, for example, my, my first experience of uh, church in America years ago um, was the classic American TV evangelist. I'd just arrived in the US, I was uh, pretty um, sleep deprived, and um, I came face to face with this American TV evangelist uh, preaching his heart out. He had a beautiful Armani suit, slick back hair, Southern American accent, Southern States accent. And his message was that God was a God of prosperity and wanted to bless my life with uh, prosperity as well. Uh, I was a struggling musician at the time, and so I was interested. And um, he had this special deal going on this particular day. He had what he called a prayer cloth. Now, it looked like a, a tea towel to me. He had um, thousands of these things, which he was willing to send to people. And um, the, the magic was that if you placed this in your garage, you'd end up with the car collection of your dreams. In your house, you'd always have the house of your dreams and so on. And um, he had prayed over it, and so the blessing was on it. And he said, I kid you not, that this prayer cloth would be free of charge with every $1,000 donation to his church. I nearly fell off my chair. Uh, because God is a God of prosperity, he said. And he showed us uh, footage of his own house and car collection to prove that the magic worked. And he had the prosperous life to prove it. Now, the, the curious thing was um, just about two or three weeks later, I was back from the US and I was invited to speak at the little country town of Kula in the pub there. And uh, my topic was the love of God. And pretty much as soon as I spoke to this pretty packed pub about the, you know, my topic was God's love, I heard this uh, woman at the back sort of shouting out at me. And she said, how can you say God loves us when he takes people from our lives? I thanked her for the comment. I went on with my thing and I saw this silhouette stand up at the back and start walking toward me and sat right in the front row and just stared me out. Uh, for the whole time. Now afterwards, I grabbed a drink, I sat down with her and heard her story. She had just lost uh, the only people she got on with in her family to a terrible um, accident. And she said God was punishing her. She had uh, left her husband for another man, she'd left that man for another man. And she said God is an ogre, a tyrant, and he's punishing me. So what a contrast. Two totally contradictory pictures of the Almighty, both firmly believed, uh, based on life experience. It raises the question, who's right? And how could you ever know? And I imagine, uh, perhaps less dramatically, uh, the same is true for people uh, watching me right now. Um, some of you have had you know, blessed lives and, you know, despite everything, you're still feeling pretty chipper. And maybe, to the extent you think about God, you project those happy thoughts onto God. And others who have had um, difficult lives, who are really struggling right now, maybe through uh, unemployment or depression or something else, um, you can't help projecting that onto your idea of the Almighty. And it leads to the understandable criticism that in the end, maybe that's all it is. Maybe God is just a projection of our feelings, of our uh, personality and experiences. Uh, this was certainly the claim of uh, Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychology, he made the point that uh, really God is entirely a projection, 
our parental longing, our longing for the great daddy in the sky. Um, it's actually much older than Sigmund Freud, um, the um, philosopher before Socrates even, um, uh, uh, Xenophanes, was adamant that there must be a god. I mean, he was rationally committed to the idea there must be a mind behind the laws of nature. Um, but he also said anything you say beyond that is really just a projection, a cultural guess, a cultural uh, projection. So here we are, differing views of the Almighty based on life experience or culture. Um, is it all just a projection? Can we possibly find clarity about God uh, beyond our mere personality, beyond our uh, preferences? It may surprise you to know that uh, this is a question put to Jesus by those closest to him. Um, our passage uh, unpacks this in a quite dramatic way. And Jesus' reply to this question um, is not just a, a new answer. It's a new kind of answer. And I hope I'm able to unpack the profundity uh, of what Jesus says. Uh, the passage is set on Jesus' uh, last hours, actually. It's a night or maybe two uh, before his um, execution. And he, after three years of public ministry, says to his closest disciples that he is now going, that this is the end. Uh, in the words of the passage, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now where I am going you cannot come. And when I read that, I imagine that if you'd been saving up your questions to ask Jesus, questions maybe you were too embarrassed to ask in front of the others, uh, this is the night that you'd ask them. You know, this is the last chance. And the way this passage is designed, it indicates that's precisely what happens. The disciples, one by one, ask their questions. Uh, first, the apostle Peter, uh, then Thomas, and then finally, Philip. And there is this increasing intensity uh, to the questioning and to the answers, actually. The questions get more pointed, but Jesus' answers get more profound. First then, Peter uh, pipes up and asks for clarity about where Jesus is going. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So Peter is eager to know the destination. Where are you going, Lord? Is it to Jerusalem, you know, to start some messianic battle? Are we going to Rome to take on the emperor himself? I can go with you and I'll even lay down my life in such a battle. But Jesus says to him, actually, you're going to disown me. And I find this remarkable. If you're not used to reading these Gospels, it is one of the signs of their truth-telling that all four Gospels report the failure and betrayal of Peter. Uh, Peter really does disown his Lord in the final moments. And all four Gospels are open about that, even though all four Gospels revered the Apostle Peter. Anyway, um, that's what makes Jesus' reassurance in the very next line so uh, poignant, despite Peter's failure, the failure of all of them, actually. There is still a place for them. Look at the very next lines. Do not let your hearts be troubled. I mean, he's just told Peter that he's going to betray him, but he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Such grace, despite their betrayal of Jesus. Uh, remember, all of them will flee, all of them but one. And Jesus says to them, there's a place for you. And, you know, if I'm not able to communicate anything else today, um, please let me make this clear. Christ is in the business of welcoming us 
despite our failures, despite our flaws. There is an eternal place for each one of us. Such grace, such mercy. Christianity is not a cancel culture. I know it has a reputation for being about cancelling people who are immoral. And certainly Christianity has its um, moral convictions. But actually, Christianity promotes a compassion culture, a forgiveness culture that's based on the founder who could look Peter in the eye and say, I know you're going to betray me, but you know what? There's a place for you still. Anyway, um, Thomas listens to all of this and he pipes up with his own uh, question. He asks the way to wherever it is Jesus is going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? What's the way to this father you speak of? Now, Jesus' answer here is enigmatic, to say the least. If you're used to this Bible passage, um, perhaps you miss how weird it is. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. This is so odd. Uh, imagine asking me the way to the little country town of Kula. And I said to you, I am the way to Kula. It's a really strange statement. But in this context, it's profound because Jesus is claiming not just to um, point the way to God, not just teach the truth about God, not just offer people the life of God. He's claiming to be that way to be the truth, to be the life. He's claiming to be able completely to resolve the dilemma of how you could know what God is like. Uh, not just because he knows it, but because he embodies it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, this is one of those really awkward moments when we realize that Jesus wasn't just a good teacher. You know, um, some people say, oh, I love Jesus' teaching. He was, he was a wonderful teacher, one of the great teachers of history. But you know what? The lovely teacher who said, you know, love your neighbor, do to others as you would have them do to you, also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It is a remarkable claim to authority. And it gets more intense still. Philip then asks his question. He wants to know not just the way to God. He wants to see God. But verse 8 says, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. It's really difficult to know what Philip was expecting I mean, Philip knew God was the creator of the universe. God is not an object in the universe. God is the source of the universe. Just as you don't expect to find the architect of your house hiding in the basement somewhere, nor, nor should we expect the mind behind the universe to be an object in the universe. So what is Philip saying? Well, whatever Philip was expecting, I'm pretty sure it wasn't what Jesus, in fact, said to him. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Honestly, I regard this as the most extraordinary statement in all sacred literature. You won't find anything like this in the Hindu Upanishads, uh, the Buddhist Tripitaka, or the Islamic Quran, only in Christianity is it claimed that God has entered the world in person, in history, in the life of Jesus. The architect has come to the house and invited himself in, if I can put it like that. This is Jesus identifying himself as God. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father, he said. 
Now, I know people sometimes try to get around this and say, oh, no, 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 Jesus was just a lovely teacher. He never claimed to, you know, be God. Um, that's just the later church, you know. Jesus started out as a simple teacher, and centuries later, the church invented this idea that Jesus is how you see God. Uh, the most famous uh, version of this is Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code from, I think, 2005. Um, I'm sure some of you have read it, 80 million copies sold. So it's an extremely uh, popular book. And Dan Brown said it was Emperor Constantine, 300 years after Jesus, who elevated Jesus from simple teacher to divine Lord. Apparently, Constantine called the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 and insisted that everyone regard Jesus as God. And henceforth, people have called him God. It's a cool story, um, sort of, <laughs> but it's nuts. The evidence is overwhelming that this idea of Jesus being God goes right back to the beginning. I mean, a century before Emperor Constantine, we have an inscription on a church floor in Israel declaring Jesus to be our God, Jesus Christ. And we have a letter from 200 years before Constantine uh, from Governor Pliny to Emperor Trajan, explaining what Pliny had discovered about the Christian beliefs. Here's what he wrote. It was all the more necessary to extract the truth about Christianity by torture from two slave women whom they called deaconesses. The sum total of their guilt or error amounted to no more than this. They met regularly before dawn on a determined day and sang antiphonally, in turns, a hymn to Christ as God. Here is a pagan Roman governor saying, 200 years before Constantine and the Council of Nicaea and all that, the only thing I can discover about Christians is they sing hymns to Christ as God. Now, the interesting thing is, we actually know the sort of hymns the Christians must have been singing because at least two of these hymns to Christ as God are preserved in our New Testament writings from the middle of the first century. Uh, here's just a portion of one of them. I know it doesn't look like a hymn, but in the original language, it's clearly um, set out in stanzas. It's more like a poem than a piece of prose. Anyway, it says, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Here is a hymn declaring Jesus to be in very nature God. And of course, the Christians got this idea and began to sing about it because of Jesus. It was Jesus who went around uh, Galilee and Judea, handing out divine forgiveness like it was his to offer. This is just one of many uh, uh, passages in the Gospels where Jesus sees this paralyzed man and declares that your sins are forgiven. And the religious authorities say, hang on, you know, this guy's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Indeed, no one. But Jesus claimed this authority for himself constantly. So this brings us back to our passage today. A passage like John 14 and verse 9 is just making explicit what is implicit throughout the life of Jesus. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus embodies God himself. Let me try and illustrate the significance of this, if it's true. Try and, right now, imagine what my father looked like. Just, you know, go run with the thought experiment. Um, now, you're obviously, you know, trying to think through, or oh, maybe not the tallest, skinniest man in the world, and you're trying to piece together, you know, uh, retrojecting back from me. Um, I lost him uh, when I was quite young, so you need to picture him in his um, early 40s. Um, but some of you are, you know, maybe guessing close-ish, to what he looked like. Um, others, maybe not so much. 
And if I got you to sketch right now on a piece of paper and take a photo and send it into me, uh, your image of my dad in your mind's eye, um, we'd have a whole bunch of different guesses, right? Now, some of them um, may be artistic, intelligent guesses, but they're still guesses. And the thing is, I can resolve the dilemma of what my father looked like um, beyond our speculation, because I can show you a photo of my dad and my mum, uh, taken uh, just a few years before he died. Now, this photo is a revelation to end the speculation, and it therefore relegates all of our guesses and speculations about what God is like. And, and my point, of course, is that intelligent, articulate, artistic guesses about God are still guesses. And if God has made himself known, if God has revealed himself, it relativizes all of those guesses. Jesus is to God what this photo is to my father, a revelation to end the speculation. Anyone who has seen me, Jesus said, has seen God the Father. Through his life and teachings and uh, miracles and death and resurrection, we get front row seats to the divine. Now, I reckon this is both a challenge and a comfort, perhaps in equal measure. Um, on the one hand, it means we're not at liberty just to invent our own image of God. Um, you know, the TV evangelist, right, doesn't get to project his greed onto a God of prosperity. And we likewise don't get to cherry pick our preferences for God. You know, I sometimes have people say to me, um, I prefer to think of God as... Now, I try and always be polite when they say that, but I am thinking to myself, you know, how dare we prefer God to be anything other than what God is? You know, we don't get to just project our preferences onto the Almighty. So here's a challenge if God has revealed himself in Jesus. There's also a comfort, especially for people whose image of God has been damaged through life experience. Like the woman I met in the pub in Kula, who couldn't think of God as anything but a tyrant, an ogre, who wanted to condemn her. Because here in this passage, we have Jesus saying that if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. At precisely the moment, he is extending this warm reassurance and forgiveness to the very people that will let him down. He reassures Peter and the others, despite the fact that you will disown me, there's a place in my eternal kingdom for you. Such grace. And even beyond that, um, the, you know, in the next 24 hours, uh, Jesus will be on a cross, giving his life on our behalf, making crystal clear that God loves us and gives himself for us. Whatever else our sorrowful life experiences mean, they can't mean God doesn't love us because God has entered into the world in Jesus Christ and given himself on a cross, taken into himself our punishment, the punishment I spoke of last week, the judgment of God coming on the world. Jesus has taken that into himself so God could look Failures in the eye, failures like Peter, like me, and say, nonetheless, there's a place for you. God has left a picture of himself in the world, and it looks like a cross. Some of you uh, may have read uh, the Max Licardo classic, No Wonder They Call Him Saviour. In it, Max Licardo uh, tells uh, a story about a family he knows in uh, Brazil. They lived in a small town, um, I think an hour out of uh, Rio. 
And the daughter in the family, uh, Christina, had always said to her mum that she wanted to go to Rio one day and experience the bright lights of that famous party city. And Max Licato says that um, her mum had always warned her not to do that. Um, life in Rio for a young girl like that could only uh, lead to trouble. There wasn't enough employment. Christina would have to turn to the most demeaning kind of um, work to, just, to, just to make ends meet. Uh, Christina didn't listen. Apparently one morning, very early, got up, packed her bags, caught a coach into Rio to go and experience, you know, sort of life of the bright city. When her mum woke up, she knew exactly what Christina had done and caught the next coach she could get on into Rio and apparently searched the city for uh, a few days, looking for her daughter, um, hoping that she could discover her, fearing uh, the worst. And then her mum had this idea um, to go to the tourist part of Rio and get a whole bunch of photos of herself, you know, like those passport photos you get in those tourist booths, put a dollar in or whatever and you, you get a photo in. She got a whole bunch of them done and then wrote a little message on the back of the photo. And then she went round to all the um, bars and sleazy joints and apparently stuck these photos all over the place, all around the city, in the hope that one day, if Christina ends up in one of these places, she would see the photo and get the message. Her mum went home, devastated, prayed her heart out that Christina would come home. Uh, weeks went by. Uh, it turns out Christina couldn't find um, regular work and had to turn to the most demeaning kind of work just to survive. Uh, too ashamed to go home, unsure what her mum would think. And one morning she's walking down the stairwell of one of these sleazy joints and she notices on the wall a photo of her mother stuck there. She couldn't sort of believe what she was seeing and she grabbed it. You can hardly imagine the, the emotions that must have flooded her mind. And she notices writing on the back of the photo. And she read the words, Whatever you've done, whatever you've become, please just come home. Whatever you've done, whatever you've become, please just come home. And she did. To the most amazing, heartfelt, joyous welcome from her family. In that moment, she had clarity. And I'll tell you that uh, apparently true story because it reminds me of this true story that God has left a photo of himself in our world, Jesus Christ. And attached to the photo is a similar message. Whatever you have done, please just come home. There is a place for you. Christ has come searching for you and me, revealed God to us and said, there is forgiveness even for those who have failed. Come home. Come home. God bless.